Welcome to the Self-Publishing Experience, the quarterly podcast about indie publishing from the team of Troubadour Publishing. Here are your hosts, Stephanie Carr and Jeremy Thompson. And welcome to the fifth episode of the Self-Publishing Experience podcast, where the team at Troubadour bring together industry insight, author conversation and tips and tricks designed to help you with your self-publishing. In this episode, we'll be looking at the historical fiction genre, addressing the effect of the coronavirus on the industry, and looking at ways you can make the most of your time in lockdown by finalising and promoting your new novel. I don't think we can start the podcast without addressing the big news that is affecting the world currently. The new coronavirus has affected the publishing industry on a large scale, with the temporary closures of bookshops being the biggest stumbling block. This has led to a lot of publishers, including ourselves, moving publication dates, for when the bookshops can reopen and books can be marketed. And in fact, even Amazon was affected, which you wouldn't think being an online retailer, because they stopped supplying books in preference for um, medical and household items, which was the first time I've ever known that happen. And also the UK's two biggest wholesalers, uh, Gardner's and Bertram's, both closed relatively early on. It'll be interesting to see how the industry and how the wider world, obviously, um, actually gets itself out of this situation and moves towards reopening. Absolutely, especially from an author's point of view, because they want to get back into bookshops and get back on with their signings and events. So, as promised, we're going to look at the historical fiction genre, and we have some interesting insights from some of our Matador authors. Historical fiction can encompass a wide range of genres, from romance to young adult, to drama and fantasy. The main theme is that it must be set in the past. But how far back do you have to go before your new book can be classed as historical? Well, the Historical Novel Society only accepts submissions for review for titles set 50 years in the past. So even though that may not seem like it's very historical in some cases, if the novel was written from a research rather than personal experiences, it is classed as historical. It's a little bit ominous for me that a book set in the early 70s is now seen as historical, as that is when I was born. It's interesting your point about research. That's something that authors could be doing now whilst in lockdown, making the most of the time spent at home. Our digital production controller, Andrea, caught up with Matador author Leslie Lodge, author of Wayland's Revenge, at our 2019 self-publishing conference to talk about how important historical accuracy was to her when she was writing. It was very important in terms of the actual events, because the book talks about things that happened in the siege of Colchester and things that happened with Matthew Hopkins, otherwise known as the Witchfinder General. He really existed. Um, and he died in that year, 1648. So it was important that the, the background timeline was accurate. It was important to me that um, the details about what people ate, what they wore, that sort of thing was right. And some of the um, horrific atrocities and things that, that people suffered during the siege was accurately portrayed. Whereabouts did you go to do your research? Colchester, it's a place where I studied for my MA. Um, you can go and see the old siege house there with the musket ball holes still in the wall, for example, from the siege, and the uh, spot outside the castle where um, Lyle and Lucas were executed are still marked. These days, you, you don't have to go to the British Library. You can order copies of primary sources, contemporary accounts. Uh, written, there's one written by a diarist, Matthew Carter, about the siege um, and Matthew Hopkins himself wrote a piece on how to decide if a woman is a witch or not. Oh, um, so you I, had personal accounts of the, of the yes, time as well. Yes, and then uh, secondary sources, uh, quite a lot of history books. Malcolm Gaskill, professor at the uh, University of East Anglia, wrote several books about the witch finder, which I went through. How, how long did you do your research for? The whole process took me five years, and I would say that m most of the first four years were the research, and the last year was the writing. Yeah. The research is addictive because you keep finding fascinating pieces, and but you have to be you have to, I think somebody phrased it as kill your darlings. <laughs> you have to take out some of the best bits because they're not relevant. They're not driving the story forward. There is a blacksmith as as one of the main characters. Did you? pull on aspects of, of your knowledge about horses yes. into that as well. Yes, because blacksmiths in those days, um, they were 
experts in making weapons, anything to do with ironwork. They were also um, fairly classless. They weren't upper class lords of the manor and they weren't peasant class. That gave them more scope to act as uh, what you might call detectives. Four years to spend on research is a significant amount of time, but it seems to have worked if you look at the reviews on Amazon. Most of them comment on how historically accurate Leslie work is. Yes, I think this helps, especially if you're trying to appeal to fans of the period. Regular readers of historical fiction will most likely have some knowledge of the time period. And even though you get a bit more artistic license with a fiction book, with historical fiction there does have to be some element of truth. This is something that former staff member Alexa Davies asked Terry Lovett when he came into the office to talk about his book Son of a Jacobite. She started by asking him how he found combining fact with fiction. I'm a bit of an historian, mm. so I'm more likely to read history and watch history. I have to fact check, obviously, when I come to certain points, but the history comes easy. Having written quite a bit of academic work, the hard thing for me was to actually do the fiction right. You know, one of the first pe people who saw one of my first drafts said something like, look, the descriptions are great and I can see all the facts in there, but I don't know what these people look like. I yeah. don't know what they're eating, I don't know what they're dressing in, um, and I need to hear their voice. So yeah. I had to go back and put in a bit of real life. How did you go about doing that the second time round to make it more fictional and, and more perhaps emotive and descriptive? Yeah, well, a few things. The most obvious thing was I put more dialogue in um, and also just filling in some of those gaps that people pointed out. It's the, it's the old adage of show, don't tell type situation. Show, don't tell. It was something that my daughter said very early on yeah. to me. And, of course, the sort of writing I've done is the opposite. In academic writing, you're telling. You're telling about facts or putting an argument together. So people might have picked up that the surname of your protagonist is also Love It. Mm. Um, so you've told us that it was sort of inspired by research you've done into your own family history. So can mm. you tell us a bit more about that? I've done a lot of research on my own family history, on both my maternal and paternal sides, and they both lead heavily to Scotland and to the Highlands, in fact. When it came to the Lovets, I could only track back in fact, to 1776, to the birth of a guy in Lancashire who is my great, 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 whatever, grandfather. And then there's nothing prior to that. And I've tried all sorts of ways to find out who, for instance, this um, Edward Lovett, born in Lancashire in 1776, who his father was. But there's no actual record. Mm. At that point, I thought, well, what do you do now? take all the clues, put them together and do a little bit of creative fiction. And both Wayland's Revenge and The Son of a Jacobite are available for sale on our website www.troubadour.co.uk Now for some news from the publishing world. There are early indications that one winner from the lockdown is the digital sector. According to the bookseller, publishers and distributors have started to see an increase in e-books and audio book sales of at least 25% year on year. Reading a good book is a brilliant way of disappearing into another world, and with delivery times getting longer for physical books, being able to download an ebook on your e-reader in seconds is very appealing at this time. It'll be interesting to see how much of an increase the official figures show when they are released. In response to the ban on mass gatherings, which has led to a lot of cancellations of events, um, the London Book Fair and the Hay Literary Festival being just two, event organisers are now offering online programmes for events with the Hay Literary Festival planning their first fully digital festival in May. There'll be webinars, workshops and live social media throughout May, all accessed through their podcast. It's similar to the Big Book Weekend, which ran from the 8th to 10th of May 2020, um, a completely virtual festival organised by authors Kit Duval and Molly Flatt. The festival was for all ages and for all fans of all genres. You can listen in to virtual panel sessions from debut and rising authors, watch performances and get the kids involved in the interactive activities. Just because you can't actually get to the event, it's nice you can keep in touch with reading and writing community. I think for all authors it's worth thinking about how you can best make use of the time you have at home. Now is the time to sort out those things which you may have been putting off for ages, like building up your social media platform for example. Take a look at your profiles and see if there's anything you can do to engage more with your followers and hopefully increase your reach. Is your author brand consistent across all of the channels? 
Not everyone uses every social media platform, so maybe consider joining Twitter if you've only got Facebook and getting an Instagram account to reach a younger market. Our assistant marketing manager, Philippa Eiliff, talks us through her top tips for social media and how you can make it work for you. Many authors look to social media as a means of promoting their book outside of any other marketing activities that they are undertaking. If you are wanting to get started on social media, it's important to carefully consider your author brand and plan in some proper time for developing it. Here are some of my top tips. Firstly, if you are new to social media, start with one platform and grow it steadily before starting another. Trying to start too many social accounts at once can lead to stress and lack of growth due to having limited focus. Research the platforms that would work well for you. Instagram is an image-led platform, for example, so this could work well for you if you like taking photos and showcasing your work. Twitter is what I would call the main author hub, as it is largely populated by authors, publishers, writers, and many others in the publishing and media industries. Facebook is more personalised, and many authors set up a page there to almost run as if it's a website with a blog. Think about how you can connect with other authors and work on cross-promotions with them. The best way to be a part of it is simply by getting started and connecting with as many authors in a similar genre or subject area of interest as you. You can also join groups and forums that tie in with these social media platforms to make further connections. It's very important not to become a pushy salesman. Nobody wants to see a series of posts that are just trying to sell a product continually. This is unfortunately an error that a lot of authors who are new to social media make, and it often means that they can get stuck in a rut. A good social media account is one that has a balanced number of posts and content. Finally, I would urge you to check out the huge range of free resources online, and I recommend reading The Ultimate Guide to Social Media for Writers 2020. It's published on a free website called kindlepreneur.com. Or you could also take the time in lockdown to start editing your novel or maybe researching a good editor that can help with what you actually need. I spoke to Aki Siltz from the Literary Consultancy at our self-publishing conference 2019 on the importance of editing and I started by asking her whether she thought professional edit was necessary. I absolutely believe that editing can make or break a book. At the Literary Consultancy we see around 500 to 600 writers per year sending in their manuscripts to us for assessment. Even those that are outstanding, we have never ever sent somebody on to an agent with no revisions. We've never recommended somebody for publication with no further notes, commentary, feedback. Um, and you hear so many stories from you know famous, well-known writers who say that they've been rejected several times in the past or has taken them 12 drafts to get where they are. And I think absolutely you are clarifying the vision of your book, you're honing it, you're working things out as you go and also when you begin a book and you end a book you are simply not the same writer with the same skills and competencies at the end that you are at the beginning so there is an inevitability to having to go back. Is it possible to spend too long revising and tweaking? Yes it is and it's very possible to write a draft that does not improve (laughs) your book. It's up to the writer to make those revisions and they can make a book better or make it worse or make it something entirely different and neither better nor worse. I think you probably know that you should stop when you've got to the point where you're tweezering words. And either I think that's symptomatic of an anxiety not to make fundamental changes, and you still might need to make those changes, or you're procrastinating about sending it off to an agent or a publisher or pressing send on the self-pub. Talk me through the different things that your company offers. So it's editorial, mentoring and events. Editorial is, uh, the core of it is assessment, so that's 75% of what we do, it's the majority of our work. Um, Manuscript assessment essentially means professional, objective, truth-telling feedback for writers who are submitting their work to us, um, who just want an opinion on it. And actually our company was created out of this vacuum of knowledge between the industry and writers. And so some people may want to submit to us because they're looking to find a publisher, but it's not necessarily the reason we were set up. The reason we were set up was to try and find a way to give people outside of that process where you get an editor and you get an agent looking at your work and feeding back to you, democratising the feedback process. Anyone at any level, and frankly with any quality of work, can submit to us and get somebody compassionately engaging with their work at a deep level, because I think that's really valuable to any writer. And I always say it can take 10 years to write a book that's not very good. (laughs) And I think also friends and family can be your first readers and they're not always objective. 
I don't think there can be objective. I think there's always an agenda. I do think, however, there's something really valuable in peer feedback because it offers a layer of support which is generally positive and writers often talk about feeling like they're working in isolation. The writing can feel very private and intimate but that peer feedback group can be so valuable in kind of making yourself part of a community. Um, but for, for objective professional feedback, it's not the place to go, no. Yeah. And what about the mentoring side? So somebody will come to us and they're partway through a book, they need the incentive to keep going, they need the momentum, um, and they get six intervention sessions with someone giving them feedback on 10,000 word chunks of their work. At the end of that process, they have six months to complete the book. They send the whole thing in to us and we say, it doesn't matter what kind of level it is, but when you're ready, send the whole thing in and we'll get a second reader to look at the whole book end to end, give you more feedback and you can come in house with us as well, with a group of your peers and with me and an, uh, an agent and a publisher and have kind of uh, what we call an industry day where you learn about what the publishing process looks like. I think a lot of writers when they start off have got no idea about the publishing industry. It surprises me that even quite advanced writers, some of the questions that they have feel quite basic to those of us working inside the industry, but you've got to remember that the industry is also not very transparent, and I think especially traditional publishing is not transparent. And so there's got to be enough safe spaces where people can ask the silly questions and say and, and learn exactly what happens behind the scenes, not just the kind of glossy media story of how a book gets from draft to bookshelf. And all of the failed drafts behind that, the dead ends behind that, the kind of hidden stuff that we don't talk about, the fact that many agents will take on tiny, tiny numbers of writers per year. Of those, not all of them will get published, so it's not necessarily the case that just having an agent means guaranteed publication with a huge advance. Aki touched there on a manuscript assessment, which is one editorial service that an author can choose. There are quite a few other different levels of edits available, depending on what stage you're at with your new book. Our editorial coordinator, Hayley Russell, explains what the different editing services are and how we can help here at Troubadour. Editing is one of the most important processes your book will go through as you make your self-publishing journey. There are many different types of editing, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and all of these serve a different purpose in how they will help your book. What we offer at Matador is copy editing and proofreading. These are along the corrective lines of the editing spectrum to ensure that as few errors as possible remain in the final printed book. A copy edit is the most in-depth edit that we offer, looking at spelling, punctuation, grammar, consistency, repetition and clarity. Have you made sure that the way that you show times is consistent? Maybe you've written the time at 2.30 with a full stop between the 2 and the 30 in one place but used a colon later on. Maybe you have a background character whose name has changed with redrafts, but it wasn't quite changed at every instance. A copy edit will address these issues along with correcting spelling and grammar, and amend them all in your Microsoft Word document with track changes, allowing you to accept or reject them as you agree or disagree. The other editorial service that we offer at Matador is a proofread. While a proofread does look at any basic spelling or grammar errors that are present in the text, it doesn't go into the same depth that a copy edit does. A proofread is carried out after the manuscript has been typeset, so it's in its final layout and mainly checks for any errors that may have arisen in the typesetting process, along with that basic spelling or grammar check. Of course, it may be that you are looking for something more in-depth to offer you feedback on the content of the book itself. Through our sister company Indigo, we offer an opinionated editing service in which the editor will provide feedback on many aspects of your book, including dialogue, pace, narrative, structure, or any aspects of the book that you are particularly concerned about. This service includes a corrective copy edit, while also providing you with that crucial feedback that you need to improve the content of the book itself. The editing process is really one that you will want to get right when you are self-publishing. You may be thinking that you have a great grasp of grammar, and that may well be the case, but when you have worked on your book for so long, with so much care, you get very close to the text itself, and that's the point where you look over the book and read what the words should say instead of what they actually say. A fresh pair of eyes is essential for any book, and an editor is crucial in helping to make your book the best it can be. You can find more information on what editorial services we can help you with at troubadour.co.uk. That's it for this episode. Join us next time for more interviews, advice, top tips and news from the world of self-publishing. You've been listening to the self-publishing experience. Learn more about Indian self-publishing at our website, troubadour.co.uk.